revealed in upcoming episodes of this program are the contents of a recently unearthed repository classified by the secret government, the Phenomenon Archives. A secret history of the United States intentionally hidden by the mainstream media? Could there be a secret society of fat moneyed businessmen whose agenda has been the cause of every major war and economic depression? Is there a shadowy elite gently pulling the strings of our world to bring about their own self serving political program? The answers may surprise you. Nearly 200 years ago, Thomas Jefferson wrote, If the American people ever allow the banks to control the issuance of their currency, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of all property until their children will wake up homeless on the continent their fathers occupied. Throughout the history of the United States, there's been this running battle over who controls how much money is in the system. Will it be some privately owned central bank or will it be the people, the Congress, for the benefit of uh, everybody in the country? Everything evolves around the Federal Reserve, a private bank that was given a monopoly on the creation of paper money. Every hundred dollar bill which the Federal Reserve system prints and is sold to the United States at full face value represents a hundred dollar loan. Even though the government pays for it, they still pay interest. One hundred years after Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln pondered these same issues. The government should create, issue, and circulate all the currency, he said. Creating and issuing money is the supreme prerogative of government. Adopting these principles will save the taxpayers immense sums of interest, and money will cease to be the master and become the servant of humanity. What do the fears expressed by Jefferson and Lincoln and modern-day economists have to do with what President George Bush called the New World Order? It's a conspiracy. What, what else can you call it? It's a conspiracy against the people of the United States and of the Western world. Just when you think you're ahead of the game, something changes. This week, we'll visit the scene of a crime so huge that most of you will not believe it to be real, and so perfect that even today, 86 years after the fact, few realize that the crime even took place. The creation of the Federal Reserve System was about more than just money. Some refer to it as the secret birth of a criminal conspiracy to rob the American middle class of its hard-earned wealth. Others believe it to be part of an attempt to bring the world under the control of a shadowy international elite that calls itself the New World Order. And through it all, we have wars, assassinations, and Martians. In fact, if it weren't for the Martians, you might have heard about this mother of all conspiracies a long time ago. We know now, within the early years of the 20th century, this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man's. On October 30th, 1938, the Mercury Radio Network interrupts the music of Ramon Raquello and his orchestra from the Park Plaza Hotel of New York City for a special news bulletin. The infamous War of the Worlds broadcast begins with its terrifyingly real description of an invasion from Mars. And before the night is out, a million people will run panicked into the streets. I'm extremely surprised to learn that a story which has become familiar to children through the medium of comic strips. And After what has been a closely guarded secret for nearly 50 years, 
Orson Welles' original broadcast turns out to be no mere show business stunt. Should have had such an immediate and profound effect upon radio listeners. But instead, was a complex psychological warfare test conducted by C.D. Jackson for the Rockefeller Foundation. When the results are compiled nearly two years later, they are released to an elite whose names most men will not speak of over a whisper. Among them, groups like the Bilderbergers, Trilateral Commission, CFR, and the Federal Reserve. Uh, C.D. Jackson was the uh, equivalent of being the head of the National Security Council uh, in the White House under Eisenhower. He was the chief of psychological uh, warfare. The breakthrough discovery that the War of the Worlds broadcast was actually a psychological warfare test is key to understanding why experts believe that the Federal Reserve, the Bilderbergers, and other closed exclusive elite groups are pulling the strings that control our societies. Well, it's a fraternity. They have a common objective. And this common objective is to maintain control. America grew so rapidly and became uh, wealthy so quickly that really we've always been the thorn in the side of this New World Order crowd. They've just never been able to get us completely under their control. So America is the target. And once, once they finally get us uh, subdued, the rest of the world would fall very quickly. Moguls like the late J.P. Morgan. A man so excessively wealthy, his likeness adorns the tycoon card in the board game Monopoly are all safely cloaked behind their own carefully constructed versions of history. But are the private agenda of these select few woven permanently into the fabric of world economy? Are we simply the unwitting pawns in a game whose rules were written amidst the clandestine corridors of private social clubs 100 years ago or more? Hundreds of miles south of the banking capital of the world, New York City, just off the coast of Georgia, Jekyll Island provided a winter retreat to the rich and famous. This tiny ocean getaway was formerly owned by the Monopoly man himself, international financier J.P. Morgan. Here, in a conclave intended to remain secret forever, six international bankers plan what is to become America's most powerful private institution, the Federal Reserve System. story is one of the great untold stories of the 20th century. These bankers who got together left Hoboken in a sealed train and the reporters were going crazy. They knew this was big. These are five of the biggest bankers in the world getting on this sealed train. The reporters wanted to know what the hell was going on and uh, they didn't know for years what had happened. It is at the urging of the famous poet Ezra Pound that Eustace Mullins begins his own personal search for the truth about the origins of the Federal Reserve. Ezra Pound's uh, young artists and writers' friends were killed during World War I. Ezra wanted to know why they died. Digging book by book, row by row, in the entire economic section of the Library of Congress, I found this little magazine with the uh, Jack Lyland story in it. When I took that to Ezra Pound, he was so thrilled, it was the biggest discovery of his life. In fact, Ezra Pound called the Jekyll Island story the biggest detective story of the 20th century. But why? Andrew Gray, grand nephew of one of the six men who met to plot the creation of the Federal Reserve System, scoffs at talk of secret cabals. Well, I'm asked what, whether uh, the Jekyll Island meeting uh, can be automatically classed as a conspiracy. And the answer, first of all, is that the need for secrecy does not necessarily imply conspiracy. Very important legislation of any kind cannot be drafted in public forum. Back in 1910, they called themselves the Jekyll Island Club. Collectively, members represented more than one-sixth the wealth of the entire world. So anxious were they to keep any knowledge of their meetings secure, they used code names even when talking to friends. We're going to Jamaica, they would say. 
and those in the know would understand they were traveling to Jekyll Island. The immediate excuse was the uh, money panic of 1907, which was engineered by Jacob Schiff and the Rockefellers to gain control of some corporations they were after. And so then they said, look, we've got another nationwide panic, we've got to have banking reform. The birth of the Federal Reserve System, uh, we know, was uh, at Jekyll Island, Georgia, in the secret uh, meeting that took place uh, that was attended by uh, Senator Aldrich, who was the chairman of the, uh, of the banking committee, and whose son I knew, incidentally, Winthrop Aldrich, uh, when he was chairman of the Chase Bank. The Aldrich bill, as it was initially called, received such violent opposition from Democrats and reformers like William Jennings Bryan that despite avid lobbying by the Monopoly men, the bill quickly went down to defeat. Once the Aldrich bill flopped, the bankers immediately moved to Plan B. It didn't work from trying to push it through with Republicans, so they tried to push it through with Democrats. We had, in 1912, a very popular president, a Republican named William Howard Taft. The bankers needed Woodrow Wilson to sign this act into law. He did not have much charisma. He had not a chance against William Howard Taft. Teddy Roosevelt, he was an explosion upon the political scene. Dynamic, outspoken, warm, colorful, exciting, inspiring. And under the surface was a man of ideals. You could say that J.P. Morgan really owned Theodore Roosevelt. You see, uh, his right-hand man, vice president of his bank in New York, George Perkins, lived at the White House. He was a liaison man with the president. And so uh, they drug Theodore Roosevelt out of obscure retirement. Roosevelt formed the Bowmuse Party and split the Republican Party and uh, elected Woodrow Wilson. That's the only way they could do it. Woodrow Wilson, immediately after his inauguration, uh, called a special session of the Congress to do away uh, with the protective tariff, uh, which had been uh, the thing that had built this country. The second thing uh, that happened was that uh, the income tax came in. And the final thing was the creation of the Federal Reserve, which took place in December, uh, around the Christmas holidays in 1913, that put the cap on this whole revolution. Most of the senators had gone home for the Christmas holidays. We call that uh, in legislative circles uh, having the uh, skids greased. And uh, the skids were greased, and they just slid it right on through. Uh, without much fanfare, the president signed it. It became law of the land. One of the major opponents during the, the Federal Reserve Act battle uh, was uh, Representative Charles Lindbergh from Minnesota, who, interestingly enough, was the father of aviator Lucky Lindbergh, the first guy to cross the Atlantic Ocean solo. Uh, and Lindbergh fought them tooth and nail and referred uh, to the Federal Reserve Act as the worst legislative crime ever perpetrated in the history of the United States. And uh, that may indeed well be true. By 1916, even President Wilson was worried. He lamented, the growth of the nation and all our activities are in the hands of a few men. Near the end of his life, Wilson said that he had been deceived into signing the Fed into law, reportedly murmuring just before he died, I have unwittingly ruined my government. In law, when any people meet together to plot to rob somebody, that becomes a criminal operation. It can never be anything else. Throughout its subsequent history, it can never overcome that initial criminal beginning. And that's where we are today, a criminal syndicate. That's all it is. It's all it ever has been. Did the creation of the Federal Reserve represent a takeover of the United States by shadowy international financiers? Certainly, the Fed was designed to serve somebody's interest, but whose? Not the American banking community. Uh, it was the international banking community. The Morgans were an international family. The fortune had first been made in England, but they were uh, allied with the Rothschilds uh, and others in England, and one of their agents uh, drafted the script for the Federal uh, Reserve. <laughs> The Rothschild family is one of the wealthiest families the world has ever known. By the early 1800s, they established themselves as the most important bankers in all Europe. By the end of the 19th century, they are said to control half the wealth of the world. As Rothschild biographer Derek Wilson explains, Rothschild critics have justification for their anxiety. 
The House of Rothschild is immensely more powerful than any financial empire that has ever preceded it. And it's able to control governments behind the scenes, secretly. Economic power, political power, go so hand in hand, and it's like Mayor Rothschild of the uh, Rothschild banking family in Germany said, give me control of a nation's monetary system, and I care not who writes their laws. Nathan Rothschild in 1820 might have more right to say that than any of his successors. In this statement is more or less absurd. The Federal Reserve does not control the money supply. The Federal Reserve influences the money supply. To say that the Federal Reserve only influences the money supply is like saying a robber with a gun to your head is only influencing you to give him uh, his money. And, uh, and of course, if you give him your money, you may be spared your life, but here again, you don't have your money anymore. There has been, in the last 30 or 40 years, a much greater international flavor to the activities of the Fed because the banking system has become global. And you could no longer regulate the U.S. money supply by simply uh, via the, the domestic Federal Reserve banks. The Federal Reserve controls the very heart of what's happening with money because money answers everything. It's the one thing that everybody wants. And when you give a private institution a monopoly on the creation of this money, you vest total control in that institution. If you have the money, uh, you can get any law passed you want. So who do you carry, whether uh, Bill Clinton is president or uh, uh, who is senator from New Jersey? It doesn't make any difference because you write a check and you get another senator. One of the stickiest questions in this debate is this. Just who owns the Federal Reserve? The city of London set the whole thing up. The Federal Reserve Bank of New York is principally owned by five merchant banks in London, chartered by the Bank of England. Perhaps England, which many have considered a political satellite of the United States in recent years, is really the one pulling the strings of international policy. It's not a matter of who owns the Fed, it's who controls it. The government has given the banks a monopoly, and then you see the Justice Department doing nothing about the bank mergers. A monopoly can only exist with government assistance, and they've given great assistance to the banking monopoly. Perhaps the headiest allegation made against those who run the Federal Reserve is that they are responsible for three of the biggest tragedies of the 20th century, World War I, World War II, and the Great Depression. Wars are very profitable. In fact, wars are probably the most profitable thing uh, an international banker can be involved in. So consequently, throughout the last at least 300 years of North American and European history, you see incidents of uh, international bankers backing both sides of a conflict. They've been trying to have a war in Europe since 1885, but the central banks of Europe had already bankrupted all the nations of Europe. They had no money. The only money was here in the United States. In order to get that money, they had to put a central bank over on the American people. It was sold as a way to bring stability to the American economy. Well, uh, what happens uh, just a little over a decade after the passage of the Fed? We see the biggest depression uh, of this uh, century in any case. For the 16 months prior to the crash of 29, the Federal Reserve increased the money supply by 62%. Now, what was happening back then? Much like it's happening today. People were buying and selling, pledging and borrowing, thinking the good times would never end. And then at the time of the crash, they pulled the plug on the money supply, and the people who had pledged their stocks, their bonds, their homes, their cars, everything, they pledged their savings accounts, they lost it all. Selling guns to one adversary while making loans to another is a common way these boys make their profits during war. And when profits begin sagging, people like Jacob Schiff, Max Warburg, and J.P. Morgan knew how to build them up again. Surprise, surprise, it's a documented fact that these fellows financed Trotsky and Lenin with billions in gold and credit to initiate the revolution in Russia. With Russia out of the war and America in, the conflict was extended by at least another two years. Two more glorious years of gun sales and wartime bank loans upon which to earn interest for many more years to come. There is no question that war is a profit-making business. Uh, after World War I, uh, Senator Gerald Nye held very famous hearings here in Washington where he 
dragged in some of the biggest bankers and industrialists and uh, put them on the spot and just examined profits that were made by some of these major interests. War is a profit-making business. Anybody who uh, says otherwise is a liar or a fool. They were able to manipulate us into World War I, and as a matter of fact, the war stretched out for at least another two years beyond uh, what it would have gone. Just when you think you're ahead of the game, some change the rules. They did this knowing, uh, with malice aforethought, to strengthen their own profits and to build their own institutions, their own banking uh, institutions. Many people believe that uh, virtually all of the wars of this century have been caused for uh, reasons to benefit small financial groups, those that uh, move in the sphere of influence of the Bilderberg and Trilateral Commission. For an example, the, uh, the war in the Balkans right now, who's been providing uh, Milosevic with arms and weapons the Soviets have who has been financing uh, the Soviet Union, their uh, military-industrial uh, complex, the United States has, European bankers have. So the bankers have been financing both sides of every major conflict. Conflict brings progress, but controlled conflict brings controlled progress. Every major war, every major conflict, arms sales, uh, loaning money to governments, uh, you get their people to pay you interest back into the uh, to the coffers of the bank, money that you created out of nothing. Nobel Prizeist Milton Friedman claimed that the Federal Reserve caused the Great Depression by deliberately reducing the amount of money in circulation. Depositors all over the country were frightened about the safety of their funds and rushed to withdraw them. There were runs, there were failures of banks by the droves, and all the time the Federal Reserve System stood idly by when it had the power and the duty and the responsibility to provide the cash that would have enabled the banks to meet the insistent demands of their depositors without closing their doors. Congressman Lewis McFadden, chairman of the House Banking Committee during the crash, agreed, saying, the Great Depression was a carefully contrived occurrence by international bankers seeking to bring about a condition of despair so that they might emerge as the rulers of us all. There was a memo circulated in advance of the stock market collapse. All the big guys, or the insiders, let's say, got out of the stock market uh, during that four-year period. They all got out. They were cash-heavy when the market crashed. They were able to buy up major corporations for pennies on the dollar. Franklin Roosevelt's own son-in-law called the Depression the deliberate shearing of the public by the world money power triggered by the planned sudden shortage of call money in the New York markets. Insider Joseph Kennedy's wealth grew from four million in 1929 to over 100 million four years later. Then as now, America's press failed to tell us what was happening. These scenes of unrest in America have never been seen before. Cameramen would shoot them, but newsreels wouldn't play them. Controlling the news started early in America. Of course, the lighter side of the news continued to get lots of play. And now, around the first bend, it's Rumble with Miami. Another guy, second game, Pat skipping it up. Now, coming around the third, it's Pat Skipper. Pat skipping it up, it's Fortunately, populists from President Andrew Jackson to William Jennings Bryan to Father Charles Coughlin were courageous enough to speak the truth. May I remind our president with all due respect that not one of these soldiers cast a ballot on that fateful Good Friday night in the spring of 1917 to force a peace-loving nation like ours to take up arms for the profiteers and the exploiters of mankind. And during the Depression, no one was more dangerous to the banking interests than Huey Long. We tried the Republican Party, we tried the Democratic Party, and then we've gone back and tried the Republican Party, and now we're back trying the Democratic Party. And unfortunately, whenever we get into power with either one of these parties, we find that the one crying need of our people, the redistribution of wealth, so that none would be too poor and none would be too rich, is always neglected by the party that is in power.
How many men ever went to a barbecue and would let one man take off the table what's intended for nine-tenths of the people to eat? The only way you'll ever be able to feed the balance of the people is to make that man come back and bring back some of that grub he ain't got no business. But assassination as a tool of political policy was nothing new to this crowd. President Jackson, for example, in his era, he was the leading opponent of the privately owned central bank. Well, what happened to him was an assassin uh, who was connected to international bankers, it was later found out, got right up to Jackson, stuck two pistols in his belly, fired both at the same time, both misfired. Jackson was saved. And interestingly enough, even though history books don't spend much time dwelling on this uh, bank problem, Jackson himself uh, numbered this as his leading accomplishment. In fact, on his tombstone, do you know what's on it? It's, I killed the bank. Seven changes the rules. Going back to the American Civil War, Germany's Chancellor Otto von Bismarck declared, the division of the United States was decided by the high financial powers of Europe. They were afraid that the U.S. would upset their financial domination over the world. They saw tremendous booty if they could substitute two feeble democracies burdened with debt to the financiers in place of the vigorous republic sufficient unto herself. Abraham Lincoln realized this and so stood firmly for preservation of the Union. But Lincoln needed money to win. Lots of it. He went to the Wall Street bankers who wanted 36% interest per annum. Honest Abe chose a less expensive alternative, choosing to have Congress issue the money. The bills were called greenbacks, and they weren't backed by gold, only by the full faith and credit of the United States. With Congress issuing the money, not one penny of interest was paid to private bankers. Uh, the assassination uh, of Lincoln was related to the bankers wanting control of the money. Uh, the same thing went for John Kennedy, that he was planning to uh, reintroduce uh, uh, the U.S. notes uh, rather than Federal Reserve notes. And of course we go back to the Constitution of the United States, which provides that the Congress shall coin the money, the currency, and regulate the value thereof. If you go out and ask the average person on the street who issues the money, they'll say, the government issues the money. That's why the lie works, because people know intuitively that the government should issue the money. Well, the Federal Reserve is neither federal and has doubtful reserves. You will not find the Federal Reserve in the blue pages of government in any phone book. You will find it in the business pages next to Federal Express. Congressman Lewis McFadden fought the Fed to his last breath. He once called it a super state controlled by international bankers and international industrialists acting together to enslave the world for their own pleasure. Two attempts were made on his life, one from a man wielding two pistols, both shots missed, and the second from a poisoning attempt, but fortunately there was a doctor on hand to pump his stomach. Of course, a conspiracy powerful enough to cause both world wars and the Great Depression would have to have a clubhouse somewhere, if only to split up the cash. It turns out they do. If you haven't heard of the Bilderbergers, it's for one reason only. They haven't wanted you to. At their annual closed-door meetings, no outsiders are allowed even close to the building. Here are gathered the most powerful individuals of the Western world united regularly at club meetings. Yet nothing is reported by the New York Times, the Washington Post, or the LA Times. What really fascinates me is the complete blackout in the American press. For more than 20 years, I've gone down to the press club every day. I check the wires in their library, mingle with other paper boys, and I ask them the question many times, why, when if uh, 120 film stars or 120 NFL football players met behind locked and guarded doors in a remote location for three days, you'd try very hard to penetrate and find out what those movie stars or football players are doing. Well, I have no curiosity at all when 120 of the world's most powerful financial leaders and political leaders meet for three days in a remote location behind armed guards in a complete blackout. Well, I have no curiosity. Actually, quite a bit of security, but it's discreet. Uh, so what would happen if someone tried to sneak through the trees back there? I don't know. 
I wouldn't want to try it. What we do hear coming out of those meetings is incredible about the plans of the New World Order to consolidate power. Political power and economic power coming together at the highest level. But the what I call the lapdog media, the controlled media in this country, you would think that they would be going to court, crying freedom of information, open meetings, sunshine law, and all of these things, but the silence is deafening. Attendees at recent Bilderberg meetings have included presidential advisor George Stephanopoulos, Senator Sam Nunn, David Rockefeller, former Senator Lloyd Benson, and Henry Kissinger. One month earlier, 50 liberal groups met in Washington to discuss their opposition to international banks and economic globalization. In reaction, one of the major items on the Bilderberger agenda was the role of liberals in various organizations. Also on the docket, the separatist movement in Canada, how fragmented Canadian provinces could be absorbed into the United States. Next, the expansion of NAFTA from Alaska to Chile to boost corporate profits by encouraging American businesses to move to Latin American countries where the costs of labor are low and environmental laws are not enforced. Do organizations like the Bilderbergers, the Council on Foreign Relations and the Federal Reserve pull the strings of our lives like master puppeteers? Or are such ideas merely the paranoid ravings of conspiracy theorists? The people who call conspiracy theorists conspiracy theorists are not the are not the conspiracy theorists themselves. We're talking about facts here. The Bilderberg Group does exist. The Federal Reserve does exist. The people who are members of the Bilderberg Group are also the people who do control the Federal Reserve. These are all facts. David Rockefeller himself thanked the media for keeping this all hushed up. If it wouldn't have been for you, then we wouldn't have been able to pursue our interests uh, towards internationalism. They're conspiring to eliminate the United States as we know it through something as simple as the elimination of our national identity. Why is it the major media would deny this? Let's look at the ownership of the major media. Let's look at the roster of, say, the Bilderberg meeting. Catherine Graham owns the Washington Post. Catherine Graham has been to the Bilderbergers. Conrad Black, one of the largest uh, media barons in Canada and Europe, has not only been to these meetings, but he has hosted the meeting just a few years ago. Every year they meet in secret, and there is an absolute news blackout. There is never anything reported in any of those papers. In this country, the press is seen as the fourth estate. You know, you've got the judiciary branch, the legislative branch of government, the executive branch of government. Then you're supposed to have the press keeping an eye on these three. If leaders from these three are working with other leaders around the world to determine economic policy, wars, human rights, etc., then yes, the press has a responsibility to get in there and to inform people. But just two years ago, I think 1997, the First Lady attended the meeting in uh, Georgia. A few papers in Georgia picked it up, but this is a first lady at a meeting with, with people who really arguably want to rule the world. Now that should have been front page news. Well, the fifth estate are the international bankers, and they, they just couldn't accomplish their goals without being to, to control the electronic media. Now what they hate more than anything else is this outbreak uh, amongst the internet, cable TV, radio talk shows. That's what they can't control. They need control, and without it, they aren't going to get what they want. Of course, one person's sinister conspiracy could just be another person's private affair. It, the Bilderberg is a, is, is a clubby atmosphere. That's what it is, really. It's a clubby, a clubby affair. By invitation only. Uh, now, when you see uh, groups like Council on Foreign Relations, Bilderbergers, Trilateral Commission, you have to remember bankers work internationally, and the central banks in all countries work together. And they do this through special groups. They, they formed the Council on Foreign Relations at the uh, Versailles Peace Conference after World War I. Now, many uh, conservatives believe the CFR runs in the United States, but it only does it secondhand because the real orders come out of London first. Decisions arrived at in secret Bilderberger meetings apparently do affect our lives as much, if not more, than the policies adopted through Democrat-Republican squabbling. When no other newspaper bothered, the tiny Washington publication, The Spotlight, 
single-handedly invaded the shroud obscuring these secret gatherings. Well, by penetrating the secrecy of Bilderberg, we were able to do an advanced story on the end of the Cold War, the downfall of Maggie Thatcher, an advanced story on the Persian Gulf War, then President George Bush's reversal from his Read My Lips, No New Taxes pledge. The financial entities that uh, dominate the Federal Reserve, the Bilderberg Group, are largely centered around the Rockefeller family and the Rothschild family. Names such as Chase Manhattan, Citibank, all these groups have moved in the Rockefeller sphere of influence and the Rothschild sphere of influence are the glue that hold the Bilderberg elite together. Most troubling of all is evidence that the attendees of these secret meetings may even choose our presidents. In December of uh, 1974, there was a major headline on the editorial page of the Atlanta Constitution that said, Jimmy Carter is running for what? And the what, the what was about this today. I'm running, I'm running for president. Jimmy Carter had been a one-term governor of Georgia hardly known to the American people. He, uh, however, had an entree into the international elite through his membership in David Rockefeller's Trilateral Commission. No one had ever heard of Jimmy Carter. I think that's fair to say. Yet, within the next several years, as he announced his presidential campaign, he started moving towards a Democratic presidential nomination. He started getting a lot of favorable media coverage particularly from media connected to the Rockefeller sphere of influence. Jimmy Carter was painted as a populist, a man of the people. I remember when we couldn't find a microphone. When in fact uh, he was moving in the highest circles of the international elite. When we discovered that the obscure governor of uh, Arkansas, Bill Clinton, had attended his first Bilderberg meeting in Baden-Baden, Germany in 1991, we were able to anticipate a political future for the young man. When I discovered in 1991 that Bill Clinton had attended the Bilderberg meeting, I was able to predict that he would be the candidate for the presidency of the Democratic Party. I didn't think he'd be elected president, incidentally. And so they picked him. The Bilderbergers actually picked him to be the president. I will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. Bill Clinton, like Jimmy Carter, was a product of the Rockefeller Empire. Bill Clinton uh, uh, has a few up on Jimmy Carter, though. Not only was uh, Clinton a member of the Trilateral Commission, but he was also invited to become a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He had the uh, imprimatur of the Rockefeller and Rothschild families. Well, you know, I grew up like everybody, every other kid in the United States, thinking our president of the United States, most powerful man in the world. But it's just not the case. You know, even Bill Clinton uh, has admitted that he is only a virtual president anymore. That was in a speech in September of uh, 1998. Just when you think the economy stable, just when you think you're made in the shade, someone changes the rule. Is there a conspiracy? If we are onto the fomenters of what's loosely called the New World Order, the free movement of capital and goods across national boundaries is clearly a big part of their agenda. The global elite have been the primary promoters of free trade precisely because of the fact that they are the ones who control the major multinational corporations. They are the ones who want to build televisions in Mexico and in impoverished third world countries and pay these people sub-minimum wages, slave wages, and then export them at gigantic profits back to the United States. But we're told by the major media in this country, which is tied in again with these international elites, that, oh, well, this is a temporary thing. It really is good for America. But it's not good for America. Look at anybody who's lost their job. Look at how their family suffers. That's the Bilderberg Group at work. That's the Trilateral Commission. That's the Federal Reserve, all these elite groups that they're benefiting, but the average American isn't. These families have been mostly in the banking business for at least 500 years, most of them. They were in the slave trade. Uh, they were in the opium trade because uh, these people are not interested in 5% a year return. They want a 1,000% a year return. And to get into those things, you need, you need to get into gold, slaves, 
drugs. That's where the big money is. Fiat currency is what we have. Fiat, uh, meaning no thing, nothing, having no value. In other words, it's backed by the faith and credit of the person who is creating the money. If you have a uh, private bank out here that is uh, creating this money, then your faith is in their ability to keep the value of this currency uh, to where everybody accepts it. We have to understand that people, not governments, not central banks, nor nation states, but people ultimately determine what money is and what money is not. It's been that way for over 5,000 years. This brings us back to our initial question. Are we citizens of a great democracy or is something more convoluted and sinister at work? Is there anything wrong with the best and the brightest controlling our country or potentially in the near future the entire world? Are international financiers in control of our lives? Are they masters of the universe? What's wrong with an elite ordering world events? Uh, there's a lot of things wrong with that. The American people, at least, have always been told that they control their own destiny through their elected representatives. But uh, when you find their elected representatives behind closed doors, uh, surrounded by armed guards who will not let the general public in, and they're making decisions that affect the future of the American people and the, Amer and the people of the world, then there are legitimate questions as to uh, why this elite should be able to dictate things. The whole point of, of one world government is uh, uh, to eliminate the concept of nationalism. Now why is eliminating nationalism bad if it would eliminate war? Well the reason is if old, old British Lord Acton's axiom, that is absolute power, tends to corrupt absolutely. If you could print a billion dollars tomorrow, well you could be a master of the universe. But you can't because they have the monopoly. As long as they can print the money, as long as they can buy the New York Times, the Washington Post, congressmen, senators, presidents, then you can't compete against them. Well, what have you got to offer? <laughs> if you have relatively few people uh, governing your government, you don't have a democratic government, do you? You've got a secret cabal here who is governing uh, the United States. And not just the United States, but the governments of England and France, Germany, uh, all the European countries, less influence in Japan, but quite a bit there too. So it's a conspiracy against the people of the United States and of the Western world. What, what'd you, what would you call it? Are the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds and the people in their sphere of influence the masters of the universe? Let's put it this way, uh, they want to be the masters of the universe, but there are a lot of people who don't want them to be. They create money out of nothing. Uh, what a scam. They have so much money, they don't care about money. All they care about is power. All they care about is being able to control this, the political situation so it goes their way. But they still have not been able to succeed in America because of the wealth and the independence and the patriotic spirit of the American middle class. That's the only thing that's holding this world from a level, from a situation of total despotism. See, if I serve you a black cup of coffee and it's 95% coffee but 5% arsenic, it's mostly coffee, but it's going to kill you in the end. What we've been doing is we've been getting a truth era mixture of events going on around the world. Enough truth to uh, make it uh, seem plausible, but enough error to get you off course. A lot of it has to do with our educational systems, uh, where we've been dumbing our kids down. And, uh, and when you dumb them down, it's the cruelest form of censorship because most of this current generation can't even read the books that these guys would be scared of. It's only fitting that we end with a quote from the man who started it all, Woodrow Wilson, a dreamer who tried to change the world for the better, but who in his final years ended up regretting many of the important accomplishments attributed to his presidency. We are controlled by a small group of dominant men, he said, of the worst ruled and most completely controlled governments in the civilized world. Is there a sinister conspiracy in control of our lives? Are there masters of the universe? If there are, I'm not one of them, nor would I want to be. Democratic societies have always been the crowning glory of human civilization, and in a democracy, the people decide they don't have their decisions made for them. Masters of the universe, you've seen the evidence, you decide.
just when you think that your life has turned sunny, you're counting your money, tasting the honey, just when you think you're ahead of the game, someone changes the rules. Stable, the interest is low, inflation is slow. Just when you think you're made in the shade, someone changes the rules. <laughs>